First. Um, so I'm not going to say much about them because really you've come to hear them. Um, but what I will say is that Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett are the world authorities on health inequalities. And it was through that that they began to realize that what you kept coming back to was the income inequality. So the way we're going to run this is that they're going to uh, present this evidence and link it with the world we live in today, uh, right now, for 45 minutes. My unenviable job is to be timekeeper, and I will do that because the time for you to debate these issues with them is also a critical, uh, critically important part uh, of this session, and we do have to finish absolutely on time. So, with no more ado, I'll welcome Richard and Kate. <laughs> Well, thank you, and, and thank you for giving up however much time you are giving up this weekend. Uh, it's very nice to see so many people. Uh, Kate and I are going to do this as a sort of, um, well, I was going to say sandwich course, but a sandwich lecture. It's uh, me, and then Kate is the nice filling in the middle, and then I'm the bread at the top and bottom. Um, I want to start off, though, uh, with this slide that really... <laughs> It's taken outside Oxford Street tube station in London. I don't know whether it's the morning or the evening rush hour, but look, every single face is grumpy and frowning and miserable. And I, I, increasingly, I think one of the really bizarre things about our society is this material comfort and luxury, unprecedented historically, and the many social failings of our societies. And in a way, that, I suppose, is what our book deals with. Um, and, uh, you know, if I'd been living in the 19th century and somebody had told me but by now we'd have all had central heating or the vast majority in cars and stuff, you'd think that we'd be some, in some kind of social utopia. And yet, if you look at the levels of self-harm amongst teenage girls or the really good evidence that mental illness is uh, increasing, um, uh, how many other problems there are. People sometimes call our book a theory of everything because we deal with, you know, violence and health and both physical and mental health and teenage birth rates and drug problems and proportion of the population in prison and lots of other things. But it's not. It's a theory of problems that are more pop common at the bottom of society. Um, and you can look at those social gradients and you can think, well, maybe the, the, the healthy, the, the um, resilient move up and the unhealthy move down and that's why we've got gradients. But I'm going to show you all those kinds of social problems, anything from twice as common to ten times as common in societies with bigger income differences between rich and poor. Which means that, uh, to a substantial extent, those sorts of problems must be responses to social status differentiation itself. Um, and that's really what we're going to show you. Um, I, I think that, you know, our message is basically as simple as that. More income inequality, more problems. Um, I, Kate and I found that most, or half our friends and relations don't uh, feel easy looking at graphs, but uh, basically you'll see lots of things that show problems go up as you get higher levels of inequality. Um, uh, sometimes good outcomes go down. Though where we really start is with this graph, which shows life expectancy against national income per person. And on the left, you've got the, the, the developing countries with lower life expectancy. And what you see there is life expectancy increases very rapidly in the early stages of economic growth. And then it levels out. We still get improvements in health, but they are no longer related in the rich countries to GNP per capita, to economic growth. And what's interesting is if you look at measures of well-being or happiness, you get a very similar shape rapid rises early on in economic growth, and then leveling out. And what that curve is really telling us, I think, is that it's in poorer countries, it's re where many people haven't got basic necessities, it's really important for people to have higher material standards. But for us in the rich world, getting more and more of everything makes less and less difference. That's why it doesn't go on rising. We're going to talk just about those countries on the top right, um, up with the woodworm in the beams there. Um, 
Uh, I'm just going to blow up that little bit um, on the top right, um, make it bigger so you can see it better. Um, so those are the countries we're looking at. Um, and you see Norway and USA are twice as rich as Israel, Greece, and Portugal on the left. And yet it makes no difference to life expectancy at all. No relationship. They're just all over the place. And yet all of you know that health is worst in the poorest areas of our societies, in the inner cities, in the poorer neighborhoods, the most deprived areas. Health is always worst there. But the whole society getting richer, even twice as rich, doesn't make any difference. And look, within our societies, we get these extraordinary gradients. This is these uh, electoral wards in England and Wales. The poorest on the right with short life expectancy, the richest on the left with the high life expectancy. It's not a difference between the poor and the rest of society. It goes all the way across. So when you're trying to understand health inequalities, don't just think about homelessness or unemployment, or people who run out of money for food before the next benefit check comes in. You've also got to be able to explain why the people just below the richest do less well. But of course that's a paradox that, you know, income or something like it is very important within our societies and doesn't matter at all between the developed societies. The explanation of that paradox is that within our societies we're dealing with relative income, social status, social position, where we are in relation to each other and how big the differences are between us. So, it, you know, it, it's about relativities. It's not about absolute standards of living anymore. It is in the poorer countries, but not in rich countries like Britain or the most of the developed countries. And as soon as you've got that idea that it's about where we are in relation to each other, you should then think, what happens if we stretch out the differences or squash them up a bit? What will the effect of that be? And we're going to basically show you that. When we talk about equality and inequality, we're never talking about any hypothetical society, perfectly equal or, or some tyranny of total inequality. We're simply taking the income differences in each of the rich developed market economies. You know, though some might like it to be about socialism or communism, this is not about socialism or communism, it's about the rich developed market democracies. And the measure we've used, simply because you can download it from the UN or World Bank and people understand it, is how much richer are the top 20% than the bottom 20% in each country? How big is that gap? And you see, on the left, the more equal countries, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, top 20% is three and a half or four times as rich as the bottom 20%. But in the more unequal societies, that includes Britain, you see the UK on the right, the gap is twice as big. On that measure, we are twice as unequal as other rich developed market democracies. So what does that do to us? Uh, Kate and I collected this uh, internationally comparable data on these problems with social gradients, the ones that are worse at the bottom of society, uh, figures for each country on life expectancy from WHO, maths and literacy scores from OECD, infant mortality, I think again from WHO, homicides, imprisonment, that's the proportion of the population in prison in each country, uh, teenage birth rates, uh, trust, that's how much people feel they can trust others, obesity rates, mental illness, which in the standard diagnostic classification, uh, sorry, the, the psychiatric classification includes drug and alcohol addiction, and some figures on social mobility. We've put them all together in one sort of, um, if you like, fruit salad of all these things. Um, they're all weighted equally, so where a country is, is it sort of average score on these things. Uh, influenced just as much by maths and literacy scores as social mobility or teenage birth rates. And what you see there is that the more unequal countries, you see them, the ones on that, using the measure I showed you just now, um, on the right, USA, Portugal, UK, doing worse on all those kinds of things than the countries on the left, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Japan, the more equal ones. 
incredibly close relationship. But look, if you re relate that same index of health and social problems to uh, gross national income per head, there's no relationship. We were bothered that people, you know, as, as inequality is a politically sensitive subject, people would think we were choosing data to suit our argument, leaving out things that might not fit and that kind of stuff. So we thought we should look at the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. It's an index that's put together by other people, nothing to do with us. Uh, it contains 40 different aspects of child well-being. So whether kids can talk to their parents goes into it, what their maths and literacy scores are like, whether there's bullying at school, whether they have books at home, uh, what immunization rates are like, all that goes into the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. And here it is uh, in the, in related to inequality. We looked actually in a paper in the British Medical Journal, we looked at all it, it, its main components. They're all related to inequality in this kind of way. So what you're seeing there is that the more unequal countries, the unequal ones in these graphs are going to be always on the right-hand side, doing worse, lower standards of child well-being. But again, look at that same index of child well-being in relation to national income per head, and you'll see there's no relationship, there's no tendency for children to do better in richer societies in the developed world. Of course, you know, we talk endlessly about child poverty as the problem, but we really have to distinguish between relative poverty and absolute poverty. And they have quite different implications. If it's absolute poverty, then, you know, they're right to talk about more incentives to industry and getting economic growth going and so on. But actually, it's, it's, it's relative poverty, or how far behind the rest of us families with children are, or how unequal the societies they're growing up in is. That's what matters now. The data is very consistent. I'm going to hand over to Kate to show you some of the separate components of our index now. Good morning. I was getting quite comfortable there, actually. Could have, it is. It is quite hard to get out of. Um, I've got quite an easy job this morning. I'm just going to show you some of the individual components of our index of health and social problems, really just to demonstrate to you the scale of the differences um, in different societies. I'm going to start with trust, how much people in different countries trust one another. So these data come from the World Values Survey, where random samples of the adult population in each country are asked simply, do you trust other people or not? And over on the left, in the more equal countries such as Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, about two-thirds of the population trust one another. And then down at the more unequal end on the right, you get down to fewer than one in five. So the social fabric is sort of torn apart in more unequal countries. Social cohesion is lower. If we look at measures of social capital, we find the same pattern. And so that affects the quality of social relationships among people in all of those different settings. So imagine being a woman walking home alone at night in a country where the vast majority of the population trust one another, compared to a society where almost nobody does. Or being a young man walking on the street and seeing a group of other young men on a street corner. Or what relationships are like on the school playgrounds or in the workplace everywhere that people interact with one another. So this effect of income inequality on social cohesion, on levels of trust, has profound sort of knock-on effects um, in a whole array of other ways. Now Richard mentioned that we looked at the UNICEF index of child well-being just to show that the selection of the problems we looked at um, was, was robust. But we also knew that people might think we'd picked the countries that we looked at selectively, you know, to prove our argument. So actually we repeated everything again in a separate test bed. We looked at the relationship between income inequality and all of the health and social problems we were interested in, in the 50 American states as well. So here are levels of trust in those American states, again related to a measure of income inequality. 
and what people are being asked is exactly the same. Data from the general social survey in the States, do you trust other people or not? Do you think they can be trusted? And you can see at the more equal end, states such as New Hampshire, Utah, North Dakota, Minnesota, Vermont, just as in those rich societies, you've got about two-thirds of the population trusting one another. But it drops down to less than a third in the more unequal of those states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, New York. So we see the same scale of difference in levels of trust and the same relationship with income inequality. I'll move on to mental illness now. Now, these data come from large surveys, again, of the adult population in each country, conducted by the World Health Organization or other bodies. They're not asking people, are you depressed, or has a doctor ever told you you're depressed? They ask people about symptoms. So they're supposed to provide us with good, comparable estimates of the level of mental illness in each country. And at the more equal end, it's about 10% or less of the population who've had some kind of mental illness in the previous 12 months. But up at the more unequal end, it's much, much higher. 23% of adults in the UK and in Australia, and that actually for us, those data are from 2003 and levels are rising. And 26% in the USA, so more than one in four. So two to threefold differences in mental illness very closely correlated with levels of income inequality. And that's important because when we see those huge differences, we can tell that what's going on as a, an effect of inequality isn't confined to just the poorest or just a tiny minority group in the population. It's a pervasive influence affecting all of us. Here are infant mortality rates in different countries. Um, very low in the more equal countries, much higher in the more unequal countries. Most of you sitting there will think that the slope of that line ought to be a little steeper because, unless I point it out, not everybody notices Singapore down in the corner over there, which is the most unequal of the countries we look at, but has the lowest um, infant mortality rate in the world. So, of course, we thought there was something wrong with those data, and I spent a lot of time trying to find a whisper of there being something, something problematic about that figure. But, but no, and in fact, I think a a lot of the answer is due to policies in Singapore around um, how migrant women are treated. They are tested for pregnancy. If they are pregnant or they get married, they have to leave. And we were put on to this um, by Professor Danny Dawling, who's here in the audience and is going to be talking to you later. So sometimes when academics talk to each other, they, they learn important things. We don't talk to each other enough, but that helped us to understand what was going on there. And it, it shows, I think, that when we do take our data, we don't exclude points that are uncomfortable for us, but we do try to understand them. Here are homicide rates. These are data collected by colleagues in Canada. And the blue triangles here are the murder rates for Canadian provinces, and the red dots are for US states. And these are murders per million people per year. So in those more equal Canadian provinces, there are about 15 murders per million people each year. And up in the most unequal US states, it's 150. So tenfold differences in rates of violent crime here, very, very closely associated with levels of income inequality in those states. Here are imprisonment rates in different countries. And these are on a slightly different um, scale to how we usually present data. Up the side there is, is what's called a log scale, where the difference between 10 and 100 is the same as between 100 and 1,000. And we've had to represent the data that way to be able to fit the USA onto this chart, because otherwise it, it would be up among the rafters. And you can see how closely tied levels of imprisonment are to levels of income inequality. If you know a country's level of inequality, you can predict very accurately its level of imprisonment. And this isn't particularly closely tied to crime rates. Um, American 
investigators found that differences in state levels of imprisonment, you can only explain about a third of those by changes in crime rates. The rest is due to harsher sentencing, um, being more willing to send people to prison for particular crimes, being more willing to send them to prison for longer and rates of recidivism, people committing new crimes when they come out. So in the USA, in the state of California, there are around 300 people in prison for life without possibility of parole for shoplifting. And in the UK, our rates of imprisonment have been going up and up. They're at an all-time high post-riots, while actually our crime rates have been coming down. And recently we looked at the age at which children are considered to be criminally responsible and treated as adults in the judicial system. And the age at which they are considered to be responsible is also related to inequality. So this harsher attitude towards those who violate social norms um, is reflected in that as well. We look at educational attainment in different countries and in different US states, and we find that in rich countries, children score better on maths and literacy tests, international scores at, at about the age of 15. But here are data on kids dropping out of high school in US states. So if you drop out of high school, it means you're leaving without the expected um, average qualification. And down at the more equal end, 10 to 15% of children drop out of high school without achieving that qualification, but it's up well over a quarter in the more unequal states. So unequal societies are wasting a vast amount of human potential. They're not doing as well in, in capturing and encouraging um, the talents of the whole population. And I think that's reflected also in the last of these um, graphs I'm going to show you, which is on social mobility. I'll skip that one. Social mobility is quite hard to measure, and what we have here is a measure of intergenerational income mobility. Do rich parents have rich children, and poor parents have poor children, or can children actually escape their sort of social origins, their class of origin. Um, and here we're looking at the correlation between father's incomes when their sons are born and the son's incomes 30 years later. And there are high levels of social mobility, a low correlation between father's earnings and son's earnings in the more equal societies and much lower social mobility in the more unequal countries. Um, and there is the land of opportunity at the very bottom, the most unequal country of all the USA with the worst social mobility. So that we often say that, you know, if you want to live the American dream, you should probably get a plane ticket to Denmark. Um, <laughs> that joke goes down well reasonably here, but when I was in Chicago last weekend talking to economists, um, it was notably muted response. <laughs> So in summary, we find that income inequality has pervasive effects and large effects on a whole range of different measures of social relationships within society, on a whole range of different measures of health, both mental and physical health, on a whole range of what we might call human capital, the way in which children develop their well-being, how they achieve in life their trajectories. So all of these things are affected by income inequality and the effects are large. So just to come back to the slide that Richard showed earlier, this striking relationship between our index of health and social problems um, and levels of income inequality. This is what I would like you to sort of keep in mind as we get into our discussion later because you'll have noticed that it's always the same countries doing well the Scandinavian countries and Japan predominantly, always the same countries doing worse, the USA, Portugal, UK, New Zealand. And income inequality provides a coherent story of why those countries do well and do poorly. And if we want to seek alternative explanations, we have to be able to understand why Japan and Sweden both do so well when they're so different in so many ways, culturally and historically. Why Spain and Portugal do so differently when they are so similar in so many other ways apart from their level of inequality. So I hope we'll, we'll come back to this one at the end.
But before I hand back to Richard, I want to discuss one more issue, and that's the fact that although the impact of inequality seems to be greatest for those at the bottom of society, among the poorest and those living in the most deprived areas, it affects all of us, um, and it affects us all the way up the social ladder. It's hard to study this because we need to be able to compare people at the same social position in different societies. But researchers looked at infant mortality records for Sweden for a number of years and classified all of them by the social class of the father using the British system for doing so. So we can compare the social class of those infant deaths in Sweden with those in England and Wales. So over on the left here we have single mothers Others, and then those in the lowest occupational social class, so non-skilled manual workers, and then over on the right, the highest professional um, social class groupings. And you can see that in every case, the red bars for England and Wales, infant mortality rates are higher. And the difference between England and Wales and much more equal Sweden in blue is greatest down at the bottom of the social ladder, but it persists all the way up to the top, so that even in that very highest social class grouping, there's an equality advantage in terms of infant mortality to living in the more equal society. In our book, we look at a number of different examples of this, um, looking at different measures of health, but I'll show you just one more example that's looking at educational outcomes. And these are literacy scores of young adults in Sweden, the most equal of the three countries here, the top line, in Canada, which comes in about the middle of the income inequality distribution of the countries we look at, and the United States, the most unequal. And children's educational scores, their literacy scores, are arranged by the number of years of education their parents have had. So that over on the left are the scores of the kids whose parents haven't had much education, and over on the right, the scores of the kids whose parents are very highly educated. And you can see that there's a big gap in achievement um, among the children of the least educated parents. It matters a lot whether you're in more equal Sweden or less equal USA. But again, that difference persists all the way up. So that again, there is a small equality advantage to living in more equal Sweden than to living in the more unequal USA. And this pattern, this sort of fanning out of seeing large impacts of inequality at the bottom but persistent differences all the way up to the top seems to be a general pattern looking across health and other problems. Um, I think I've come to the end of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to hand back to Richard to discuss some of the underlying causes of what we're seeing here, and then we'll have discussion with all of you at the end. I, I don't know whether you've come to the end or not. It depends what the next slide is. Um, I think this is change over one. <laughs> Um, I think and basically what we've told you is something that in a sense is very obvious. Problems related to social status within our societies get worse when the social status differences increase. You know, it really does fit the intuition that people have had about inequality since probably before the French Revolution, that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive. And intuitively, we've known that for a very long time. What's new is that we now have this com internationally comparable data that allows us to show how true that is. Actually, it's truer than I think uh, most of us ever imagined. I never thought that we'd be able to see the effects of inequality uh, by comparing different rich developed market democracies. Um, I thought maybe a, a perfectly equal utopian society would feel different, but uh, I didn't think it was even worth looking at the data for years and years. Uh, anyway, in terms of explanations, I think we do have to think of an evolved sensitivity to uh, social hierarchy. Not only to social hierarchy, I think, but also to, to friendship. Uh, those are both very powerful influences on, on health. Friendship, very protect, protective of health, and social status divisions, the bigger they are, the worse the health, the lower your status, the worse your health. Um, I think one of the indications that I, I find really remarkable, which I think helps people start thinking about the causation of this uh, in the right sort of way, is 
this that comes from the Whitehall studies, following up 17,000 civil servants, uh, you know, keeping tabs over them, on, on them uh, uh, over decades. And what it shows you is levels, I'm uh, sorry, the bottom of that, the title is uh, got mixed up. Uh, fibrinogen is a blood clotting factor. More fibrinogen means your blood clots faster. And it's showing levels of fibrinogen by where you are in the office hierarchy. One is the most senior, six is the most junior. So the top civil servants are one, and the most junior office staff are six, uh, and the ones in between. And it shows men and women. And what you see is that lower status civil servants have higher blood clotting factors. Their blood clots faster. Now think about monkeys in a social hierarchy. Who do the subordinates have to look out for? The most common wounds they suffer are not from being caught by a lion or something. It's the dominance they have to look out for. They have more bite marks and so on. And of course, one of the stress responses that you need if you're threatened with some attack, some emergency, uh, is that your blood should clot faster. And I think you need to think about our sensitivity to social status in that sort of way. Um, I'm afraid I've forgotten what the next slide is. Oh, yeah, that's not very helpful. But there are lots of ways in which um, these social status differences get under the skin. Uh, not only in biological ways like that, but I think there are a number of different ones. Uh, but also, uh, I take something like the tendency for homicide to be so much more common in more unequal societies. It seems as if that relationship is because violence is so commonly triggered by fe people feeling looked down on, loss of face, disrespect. Um, and in a more unequal society, of course, where social status matters even more, there's more at stake, if you like. Some people are hugely important and other people are really insignificant. Where you are matters even more. We judge each other more by social status in a more unequal society. Uh, and uh, so there's more status competition, um, more status insecurity. And I think the increased violence is that status insecurity. More worried about how you're seen and judged. Uh, you're more sensitive to being looked down on and disrespected. Um, but another way it, that inequality or these social differences get under the skin is uh, shown in a series of experiments, there are now lots of them, called social stereotype experiments. I don't know whether any of you remember the reports of what are called the blue eyes experiments in American high school, I think, um, a long time ago. You'd never get ethical approval to do work like that anymore. But they told kids, uh, the blue eyed kids, they found that they're brighter than others. And uh, so, uh, well, I think it was the ones without brown eyes or something like that. And uh, over a week or two, those kids did better. And I think you saw uh, the social divisions opening up between the kids. And then the teacher at the end of that period said, oh, I've got it wrong. It's the brown eyed kids who are better. Um, and there's a lot of work now showing that kind of sensitivity. Here's just one graph. This is high and low social status uh, students coming from high or low social, social status backgrounds um, doing something uh, basically like an intelligence test. And one group are, said, are told, this is not a test of ability, we'd just like you to answer these questions. And the other lot are told, this is a test of ability. Uh, so there's immediately that threat and of course there's this, the, the assumption that low status people are likely to do worse. And when they think it's not a test of ability, they do almost equally well. But when they think it is, a huge gap opens up. There's another experiment that we often show kid, kids from different Indian castes uh, when they do or don't know who is high and low caste. And as soon as they do know, the low caste children do much less well. Um, men and women. You can, Kate was reading something to me the other day, an experiment where women do less well uh, on some kind of uh, test if they have to say whether they're men or women, tick a box, men, male or female at the top. 
that effect is, uh, seems to just about disappear if they tick the box at the end of the test rather than the beginning. We're extraordinarily sensitive to these social stereotypes. Um, so I think, you know, basically it's about people feeling valued or devalued, about feelings of superiority and inferiority. It's about the psychosocial effects of these material differences. It's about the material differences, but affecting us through their social meaning. Um, and I think that increased status insecurity, our worries about how we're judged and so on, uh, get into, affect us quite intimately. You know, our worries about how we're seen and judged. Um, I, no, that's, yeah, it, it, there've been a lot of experiments looking to see what most reliably rise, raises our levels of stress hormones, cortisol, that you can measure in saliva or blood. Um, and experiments in which volunteers have been invited into a psychological laboratory and given stressful tasks to do, you know, writing about an unpleasant experience or doing mathematical tests, sometimes having to read your marks with that extra embarrassment at the end if you've done badly, uh, sometimes being videoed while you did, thing, did these things. And someone went through all those experiments, they found 208 of that kind of experiment looking at how your stress hormones respond to doing something stressful. And they asked what kind of tasks most reliably push up levels of stress hormones. And they found that it was tasks that include what they called social evaluative threat. They say in the paper, threats to self-esteem or social status where others could negatively judge your performance. You know, situations where you're afraid of making a fool of yourself, basically. We all know that's what really, you know, bothers us. And increasingly, I think what the epidemiology, the work on, on the psychosocial influences on health suggests, is that although, of course, there are other awful stresses, like being unemployed or maybe even feeling you're not going to keep up with your mortgage payments and you might lose your house and so on, the most common stresses in the population as a whole are these worries about how we're seen and judged. You know, the main psychosocial risk factors for health are social status that I've already talked about, friendship, and stress or difficulties in early childhood, like poor attachment, domestic conflict, things like that, or loss of a parent. And what all those three things are telling us about, I think, is the same underlying feelings of security, insecurity, whether we're valued or not. I mean, the insecurities that go with low social status are rather like the insecurities, perhaps, which uh, you may, may have from a difficult early childhood. And friendship fits into that pattern and is so protective of health because if you have friends, the people you, you can relax with. They enjoy your company. Um, you feel better about yourself. Uh, whereas if you feel people avoid you, choose not to include you in things, um, you find that friendship hard to make friends, we all have those worries, those self-doubts about being boring, unattractive, stupid, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think that what the epidemiology is really telling us about is that sort of thing. I may say that the studies of friendship, a recent review of friendship and health studies, which reviewed 150 of those studies, found that whether or not you have friends is more important than whether or not you smoke to stress in, uh, to, um, uh, uh, health in a, to survival in a follow-up period. Friendship matters as much or more as smoking. Anyway, um, this is the slide we started out with, everyone looking gloomy. And you know, the failure of our material prosperity to produce something 
um, you know, a, a, a bit closer to the social ut utopia. Uh, a, a failure to get something, you know, a bit like this sort of conviviality. And I think, in a way, that's what I'd like to think our work was about, changing the nature of social relations in our society. Um, and indeed, I think the take-home message is that we've got to the end of really improving the real quality of our lives by pushing up levels of material consumption. You know, that's just consumerism and um, status competition and so on. The way we now improve the real quality of our lives is to improve the quality of social relations between us. And the exciting thing is that there's now a policy lever on that. We don't all have to go and see shrinks like uh, um, Richard Layard's book suggests. Um, but by reducing the scale of income differences between us, it looks as if we can improve the psychosocial well-being of whole societies. Remember, this is not just about the poor. Thank you. Um, one last take-home message to add to Richard's. Um, we would welcome you to visit the Equality Trust website. The Equality Trust we set up with, with friends and colleagues um, and works to educate people about the impact of inequality and also to campaign for change. There are local groups um, all over the country and there is a southwestern group. If you go to the website and look for, for the local groups page, you'll be able to make contact with the southwest group through there. And also, there's a representative of the Equality Trust, Craig, who's got a stall in the craft tent, which I think is out on, on the main lawn. So do visit us either in the tent or at the website. Get involved with your local groups. Let us know how you respond to the work. And hopefully, we can all keep on working collectively towards the nice picnic kind of society that, that Richard showed. Thanks. <laughs>